One of the most controversial moments in Hogwarts Legacy comes at the climax of Sebastian Sallow's story with his debatably murderous act of avunculicide. It's a topic I've seen many of you debate in great detail in the comments of my previous videos, with reporting him to the authorities or keeping silent on the matter being the ultimate choice you have to make at the end of his storyline. So I stand before you today, ladies and gentlemen, representing Sebastian Sallow. Join me on this full deep dive, looking at his motivations, values, actions and objectives to understand everything that pushed this young wizard to using the killing curse. I hope to convince you by the end that Sebastian is not only an innocent victim, but also a hero, worthy of our eternal respect and gratitude. Indeed, Sebastian Sallow is the boy who did absolutely nothing wrong. And here's why. Before we begin, massive shout out to the supporters over on Patreon who are crucial to the long-term success of the channel. A bit more on that at the end, but without further ado, let's begin. To understand why Sebastian is innocent in all of this, we have to go back to the beginning, establishing the basics of what's taken place before we meet the kid and get tangled up in this tale of woe. Sebastian and Anne Sallow are twin siblings born sometime between 1874 to 75, making them between 15 and 16 like the main character in 1890 when our game is set. Their parents were both Hogwarts professors but died a good many years ago, and the pair have since lived under the care of their paternal uncle, Solomon Sallow. Solomon is an ex-Aura who quit working for the Ministry under less than ideal terms. We'll touch more on this a lot later, but as of 1890, he now lives away from it all in the remote hamlet of Feldcroft, not too far south of Hogwarts. Shortly prior to the events of the game, the recent goblin uprising has led to a string of attacks on Feldcroft. During one of these, Anne rushes out to help wounded villagers, only to be hit with an utterly debilitating curse. This is presumed at the time to be from a goblin, and she merely remembers hearing the words, Children should be seen and not heard. After suffering this quote-unquote goblin curse, Anne is no longer able to attend Hogwarts, the pain of the curse being far too severe to function in social settings. Initially, Solomon tries several cures, starting with Nurse Noreen Blaney of the Hogwarts Hospital Wing, and then visiting St Mungo's Hospital for Magical Maladies and Injuries down in London. This, by the way, is where Neville Longbottom's parents and Gilderoy Lockhart will one day be future long-time residents. And it's fair to say, there's no finer magical healing institution in the rest of Britain. Nothing, however, can cure Anne, which leads to Solomon adopting an acceptance mindset, and focusing merely on making Anne comfortable for whatever days she has remaining. Her twin brother Sebastian, though, doesn't give up that easily. And just because healthcare experts with hundreds of other problems to deal with at once don't know of any cure for Anne, that doesn't necessarily mean there isn't one. And Sebastian will pour every living fibre of his soul into finding a way, whatever it takes. With both talent and determination, he knows he's going to cure his sister, even if this means tapping into either dark or merely unknown magic. And that's where we come in. Enter the player character. For about three quarters of us, we'll be introduced to Sebastian during the Defense Against the Dark Arts class when facing him in a duel. But let's first look at how he introduces himself to Slytherins in their common room. Can I help you? Oh, you're the new fifth year. I'm Sebastian Sallow. Welcome to Slytherin. Thank you. Not everyone has a ministry escort to school. He was a friend of Professor Figgs who merely joined us for the ride. Still, impressive. Dreadful way to go, poor fellow. Glad you and Fig are all right. This encounter immediately teaches us a lot about Sebastian. First of all, take note of the book he's reading. We'll soon learn that Sebastian has a tendency to break into the restricted section to read up on forbidden knowledge, and that's no doubt where this book is from. His initial tone is abrasive, but immediately changes to sound much more charming when he realises who we are. He's particularly interested by the fact we had a ministry escort and escaped a dragon attack. Now, my thoughts on this are that he doesn't want distracting from his important research to save his sister, but based on what he already knows about us, figures we could be a potentially powerful ally worthy of his friendship. That's both perceptive of him and true. Crying about the definitely restricted book, he's not fully open with us as to its nature, but seems pretty chuffed when we display a curiosity for forbidden magic. Are you saying some spells aren't taught at Hogwarts? Which ones? Seems I may have met a kindred spirit. <laughs> that is a conversation for another time. 
This is a fundamental component of our relationship going forward. Now, on to defense against the Dark Arts. As we enter this class, Sebastian is engaged in a friendly duel with the Gryffindor Leander Pruitt. He's clearly a dedicated learner, wanting to brush up on skills before class even begins. After a quick duel with Sebastian ourselves, there's not a single note of bitterness when we win. Bearing in mind we're a brand new fifth year who should be utterly terrible with magic, beating one of the most talented and advanced students at Hogwarts. A typical Slytherin stereotype would behave like much more of a brat and likely accuse us of cheating, but Sebastian merely congratulates us before then inviting us to an exclusive club to hone our skills even further. He's not jealously trying to stifle our talent to maintain an upper hand, but instead genuinely wants to help us. And yes, whilst part of this intention is to suit his own ends later, a lot of this is just him being a downright loyal and supportive friend, as we'll continue to explore. There's also this snippet of dialogue from the end of Charms class. Of course, you can use Accio on humans, if you're so inclined. Well, you'd be using it on clothing, to be precise, Sebastian. You know it won't work on humans. Again, this immediately tells us a lot about Sebastian as a character. Whilst the laws of magic literally forbid Accio from working on humans, this shows us that Sebastian is unconcerned with specific rules and only cares about results. Sure, Accio can't work on humans, technically, but against any clothed individual, it's still an effective spell in a combat scenario, something we demonstrate time and again throughout our playthrough. Why neglect a method that can save your life in the name of established rules and made-up definitions? If we choose to travel to Hogsmeade with Sebastian, he'll show once again that he values pragmatism over pride. You're the only one who's ever bested me in a duel. The way I see it, I'd be wise to keep an eye on you. He also divulges here the fact that he can see Thestrals, displaying a new level of openness and vulnerability in the friendship very early on. But you've seen quite a bit yourself firsthand too. Most notably that dragon attack. Hopefully the rest of your year isn't as eventful. Ha, funny. It's also the first instance of seeing Sebastian's complete faith that his sister will recover. Oh, is your sister in Slytherin too? She is, or rather, she was. She's not well at the moment but she'll be better soon and back at Hogwarts. Now, it's unclear at this point whether St. Mungo's has already proved a failure, but from the fact that Sebastian was extensively studying forbidden magic that morning, my guess is that all conventional options were already exhausted before the start of term, meaning he fully believes here that he will be the one to find the cure. Sebastian then goes off to buy something for Anne, and presumably it's the shrivel fig that he gives her later, though this is quite a while before we visit Feldcroft, so it could be something else. We're then attacked by the troll, and this is Sebastian's first demonstration of real bravery. Now remember, in his mind, dying here will mean there's nobody left to cure his sister. But Sebastian fights anyway, and whilst we've proved ourselves a capable duelist by this point, I'd imagine he believes that leaving us alone here would still result in our certain demise. He stays, he helps us, and defends the good village of Hogsmeade, despite being a 15-year-old boy with every reason to run and hide. He demonstrates the same level of bravery as the Gryffindor Natty, who does the same if we travel to Hogsmeade with her. Now, there's no doubt that some of Sebastian's actions during our friendship could be interpreted as manipulative. We'll explore them as we go, but just remember, Sebastian risked his life for us from day one. He had every reason to believe that he'd be carrying this fight, yet he stayed anyway. It takes guts. Sebastian's next display of true friendship comes a short while later, when we need his help to break into the restricted section. We share some details with him of our escapades during the prologue for context, and not only does he agree to help us without hesitation, but he also promises to keep our secrets. That evening, he teaches us disillusionment in another bid to be a supportive friend. Sure, we can't very well get into the restricted section without it, but my point again lies in how open he is with sharing knowledge. Sebastian really doesn't care about being better than everyone else. He has no concept of moral or magical superiority, and is again single-mindedly focused on helping Anne, and also it seems, now us. When the librarian presents herself as an obstacle to our plan, Sebastian humbly devises a plot involving teamwork between the two of us to steal the key. Again, we are proving to be a more than capable wizard and a quick learner, but the immediate faith he places in us again, and the humility in not trying to handle this situation alone, is again a demonstration of a constructive and powerful friendship in the works. When we press him on his reasoning for breaking in here so often, he without hesitation divulges why. I'm looking for a cure to help my twin sister, Anne, so that she can return to Hogwarts, because Merlin knows everyone else has given up. 
Then the final show of friendship for this quest comes when Sebastian takes the fall for us. With Peeves being a snitchy little prick to Geist, Sebastian opts to duck out here to allow us to continue without getting caught. Again, very decent thing to do however you look at it. Wait, I don't want you getting into trouble for me. I have a way with the faculty when it comes to disciplinary matters. Besides, I like having friends who are in my debt. Now, you could take this line to be a pure show of manipulation here, and yes, no doubt Sebastian sees our potential and wants to keep us on side. After all, physically and socially powerful friends like us and Ominous, whom we'll get to soon, can no doubt open more doors which may be of help to him. Sure, call it manipulation, but the fact that he's perfectly transparent about it says a lot. We are in his debt now, and we know it, but it doesn't mean it's an unhealthy friendship. Throughout the course of the game, Sebastian ultimately gives a lot more than he gets in return. Perhaps things could have turned out differently, and we might have been asked to use ancient magic to save Anne, which is a very controversial thing in the main story, but as we'll explore more as we go, Sebastian clearly just exercises a healthy dose of give and take in this friendship, only expecting reasonable help in return for what he's done for us, and never really acting toxically but for one potential instance. In certain scenarios, in fact, I'd say we more have the potential to manipulate him, as we'll see. So we next come to the Undercroft, where we learn Confringo. Again, taking us to his secret hideout is another mark of true friendship and trust. Sebastian knows full well that bringing us here may very well piss off Ominous, his other best friend with powerful family ties. Nevertheless, we're entrusted. Sebastian mentions blood status here, and I think an important thing to draw attention to now is how this group of Slytherin students don't ever actually care about blood status, unlike a great deal of Slytherins and other houses still do. Our own characters heritage is never touched on in the game, but I would strongly assume that they're muggle-born, or at the very least raised in the muggle world. After all, surely any wizarding parents would fly their kid up to Hogwarts themselves if they never received a letter. The only other option is that we were an apparent squib for 14 years, that's a non-magical child of magical parents, but regardless, my point is, Sebastian, Anne and Ominous were clearly once a power trio with a thirst for knowledge who displayed an extraordinary magical aptitude, this all at the same time as displaying a refreshing refreshingly modern take of not giving a damn about blood status. Considering this is a hundred years before Harry Potter as well, in which blood status is still obsessed over, it's an even more impressive feat. And just another reason why these three are such good, open-minded, free-thinking kids. A huge contrast to the closed-minded Solomon who we'll get to. But I digress. No sooner than we're here does Sebastian opt to teach us Confringo, claiming that dangerous magic is only such in untrained hands. It's an interesting bit of foreshadowing, as we'll find out out, and Sebastian kind of proves his own point by how irresponsible he later is when learning far more dark and dangerous magic with zero proper guidance. Anyway, after this, we can tell Sebastian about our ability to see ancient magic. You must promise to keep this between us. I trusted you with knowledge of the secret Undercroft. You can trust me. All right, I can see traces of ancient magic. Ancient magic? I don't know what I was expecting to say, but it wasn't that. And he's fully, genuinely surprised to learn this. I figured he might have got an inkling when we blasted that troll into atoms, but apparently not. He knew nothing about ancient magic even from the restricted section, and has therefore been helping us the whole time, not necessarily expecting as much in return as we have the potential to give him. But now we have his attention, and once again, he offers nothing but aid. Well, when you do know, tell me. I've been studying archaic forms of magic for ages. Perhaps we can help each other. He also here invites us to Feldcroft soon to meet Anne. And this is where things start to get really interesting. When we arrive at Feldcroft, we're immediately introduced via cutscene to Anne and Solomon, and this scene establishes a hell of a lot about the relationship dynamics between the three. Watch Solomon's expressions in the background here as Sebastian presents the shrivel fig. Aha! Sebastian, where did you... What I think it is. We've been over this, boy. Hey. Shrivel figs cannot reverse a curse. Nothing can. The sooner you accept that reality, the better. But we haven't tried everything. There is no cure! When will you accept that? Never. I can never accept it. <laughs> now look what you've done. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
Something that really stands out to me here is the finality with which Solomon continually declares there's no cure. And in a world of literal magic where seemingly everything is possible, Solomon just gives up after trying merely the most obvious solutions. He has the arrogance to declare the end of hope with complete certainty. But worse still, he's determined to prevent his nephew from trying anything as well, ultimately forcing Anne to conform to the belief that she's utterly doomed, not even allowed to live with a shred of hope. If we talk to Solomon, we can raise some excellent points about Sebastian's single-mindedness and determination. Besides, on behalf of my nephew, he doesn't know when to stop. He thinks he can help Anne, oh, but nothing can be done for her. It could be that you've not yet discovered the cure. Ah, you sound like Sebastian, thinking you know better than the healers at St Mungo's. Perhaps the healers don't know everything, sir. Sebastian is single-mindedly focused on finding a way to help his sister. If there is a cure, he will find it. Your faith in Sebastian is misplaced. Some sort of dark magic cursed Anne, and the goblins aren't likely to explain themselves anytime soon. So not only is Solomon prepared to give up easily, he actually believes the goblins might hold the key to undoing the curse. It later transpires that Victor Rookwood cursed Anne, but Solomon doesn't know that. And as his power level later demonstrates, he's more than capable of incapacitating some goblins and extracting answers from them, via questionable methods, if he was so obliged. But he doesn't even want to try that. The only thing to do now is keep Anne comfortable and stay out of the loyalists' way. The quote, all that is required for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing, screams in my head here. Solomon is choosing his ideals over his family. Ideals which it will later transpire are utterly hypocritical. Anyway, let's hear from Anne. Sebastian mentioned something about your uncle being an ex-Aura, but refusing to go after Ranrock's loyalists. I must say, I wasn't prepared for him to be as angry as he was. Uncle Solomon is frustrated by what happened to me, and by Sebastian for thinking he can fix it. They both mean well, I know they do, but my uncle is right. This curse cannot be undone. I can feel it. Sebastian cannot take away my pain. Perhaps you can help him to understand that. The tragedy of these words is that they're so similar to what Solomon has already said, and it feels as though Anne has been fully gaslighted by her uncle into giving up hope. Granted, she may have a genuine instinct that this can't be cured, but I'll reiterate, this is a world filled with magic, and Anne is an incredibly bright and talented witch who clearly bore the same thirst for knowledge and rebellious streak as her brother still does. I doubt she'd have given up so easily without Solomon constantly repeating this. There is no cure! Let's compare Sebastian and Solomon's characters for a second. Sebastian possesses immense talent and perhaps some arrogance, but I'd say that's more just a display of confidence in his own abilities. He trusts others and is never afraid to ask for or accept help. He's stubborn, yes, unyielding when it comes to not giving up on values which matter most, those of family and friendship. Solomon, on the other hand, is talented and arrogant too, but his arrogance stretches to the belief that his worldview is superior to others, and that nobody else, aside from him is capable of making good moral judgments. He shuts down any attempts for an open discussion with someone whose perspective differs from his. He's angry, and it seems as though he doesn't want a solution to this, he just wants to be angry. Hell, I'd imagine if a genuine cure was discovered and brought to him, he'd probably reject it on some loose grounding that he doesn't understand how it works, and he knows best. His stubbornness is strongest when it comes to holding on to his narrow perspective. His worldview supersedes the welfare of those closest to him. Anyway, all this to say, the established dynamic here is absolutely crucial to the events yet to come. In the shadow of the study is the quest wherein we learn Crucio. It's the darkest scenario we've wound up in thus far, and serves as yet another test of Sebastian as a friend, which again, he passes with flying colours. Now, let's be clear, at the start of this quest we have to get Ominous on side, and despite his clear reluctance to tamper with dark magic, you could say we manipulate him into taking part. But, to quote Morpheus, Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Indeed, if we do this, we'll find out what happened to Ominous's aunt, Noctua Gaunt, who disappeared years ago in the scriptorium which we want to explore. Ominous could still reject us, but a part of him does want to know the truth, and ultimately he feels better afterwards for doing so. Soon though, we become trapped, with the only way out being for one of us to cast Crucio on the other. There's multiple options here, so let's start with Sebastian casting it on us. I want to learn the curse, but I won't cast it on you. You need to cast it on me. I shan't forget this. 
There's no objection from Sebastian here, but he does display clear gratitude. At the end of the day, he's kind of saving our life doing this, and he's respecting our decision of not wanting to cast it, which to some would be morally worse than suffering from it. But if we request to cast it on him... I want to learn the curse, and I think it's best if I cast it on you. Very well, if that's what you want. To perform the spell, raise your wand, point it at me, and firmly declare, Crucio. Hold on as long as you can. He accepts without question. After all, it is saving all of our lives, but he could have just as easily made out that it needed casting on us since we don't know it and oh, it's too difficult to teach now or, or something. The fact that he offers to teach us a new spell and immediately suffer from it serves to be nothing more than a decent display of friendship and bravery. When we finally enter the scriptorium, Sebastian doesn't shy away from the hardships we and Ominous have endured for him. I don't want to leave, but I owe you, both of you. Without both of you, we'd never have made it this far. Fine, this could be a rewards tactic, making us more agreeable to help him again. But at the end of the day, he potentially just got majorly crucioed, so we didn't have to. And you can't deny, there's honour in that. And like I said, we do all win a little bit here, this time. With even Ominous getting closure from this. I suppose after all this, I am grateful to know what happened to her. Thank you. Speaking of Ominous, he is without a doubt a key component in this case. Far more sceptical than Sebastian and way less agreeable than us, Ominous is a much stronger voice of temperance when it comes to anything with dark magic. And the best place to learn his motivations is during the Shadow of Discovery quest. Here, Ominous objects heavily to Sebastian finding and using Salazar Slytherin's relic to cure Anne. Here's what he has to say. But he's as irresponsible and reckless now as his parents were years ago. It's why they died. I knew his parents died, but I never heard what happened. Mr. and Mrs. Sallow were professors, spent nearly every waking moment in the cellar library, noses buried in books. Anne and Sebastian were upstairs when it happened. They heard a sudden crash and ran downstairs, but it was too late. Their parents had crumpled to the floor. A defect with the lamp in the cellar caused the room to fill with an undetectable toxin. Sebastian and Anne were helpless. They had no magic yet. What a horrible story. It is. That's why I can't understand Sebastian's recklessness. I've practically lost Anne. I cannot lose Sebastian too. Okay, you can see where he's coming from. Unlike Solomon, Ominous's source for concern is at least fully transparent. The Sallow parents died by not respecting safety precautions or buying a carbon monoxide detector. And Sebastian leaping into using centuries-old dark magic is extremely reckless. Obviously though, time is of the essence with Anne's deteriorating condition, though I imagine the fact he feels blocked at every turn, mostly by his uncle and Ominous to a lesser extent, sure does spur him on more to throw caution to the wind, before, you know, someone comes along and puts a stop to it all. I do wonder if Ominous were more supportive of Sebastian studying the book, but stayed by his side as a more lenient but also more present voice of reason, could things have turned out differently? What I'm getting at here is the fact that Sebastian had so little support throughout this whole thing that it merely accelerated his recklessness. Let me know your thoughts on that one down in the comments. So basically, Ominous would rather only lose one best friend, which he's already accepted, than risk an all or nothing deal of quite possibly losing both. No doubt the hopeless opinions of those around him, though, are painting this option to be a certain doom for Sebastian. The next major development in the story is in the Shadow of Time, where we learn our second unforgivable, Imperio. Unlike last time, where it's a life or death situation, learning this one is a lot more chill, and yet another example of Sebastian respecting the fact that two fully prepared wizards are better than one. He believes Imperio may be important for the dungeon ahead, so wants to make sure we know it too. Say what you will about the morality of this, but seems to come from a place of care, as far as I'm concerned. We find the relic, and Sebastian single-mindedly takes ownership of it. Fair enough, this is his quest we're on, and the relic is to help Anne. But then, Ominous shows up again, and here we have two options. Side with Ominous and promise him that we won't support Sebastian's endeavours further after this, or exploit a moral workaround using Imperio to force Ominous to comply with our demands. Therefore, he can't be held morally accountable should things go tits up. This is potentially another example of us, the player, using an unforgivable curse. And I'd imagine for the majority of us, we've used Crucio plenty already by this point. It would be 
very hypocritical of us then to get someone else into trouble purely on the basis of them using unforgivable curses. Sebastian feels bad for having kept this from Ominous, but ultimately the goal of saving Anne is just too important. She is wasting away, and it's no doubt life or death here. Anyone who isn't fully on board is an impediment to the mission. Whatever happens, we then return to Feldcroft in the midst of a goblin attack. And whilst fighting off the invaders, this cowardly asshole figures he's out to kill a human today. And what would be more honourable than striking down a weak, cowering young girl in cold blood? Well, thank God, Sebastian sees this at the final moment. Imperial! An unforgivable curse. From that damned book, no doubt. Your father would be ashamed. You've gone too far, Sebastian. Stay away from her. From all of us. Look, Sebastian saw this goblin with a literal split second to do something. He uttered the first effective spell that came to his head, the one at the forefront of his mind, no doubt, based on the events that had just transpired back in the crypts. Could something like the Pulso have worked? Maybe. But what if the goblin had had a red or yellow shield? Only an Unforgivable would have saved Anne with 100% certainty the first time. And Imperio is still the better alternative to Crucio, which we know Sebastian also knows. But then, as for the throat slitting afterwards, fine. That that's a malicious act of revenge on those who Sebastian believes are behind Anne's curse. But this goblin did literally just attack and try to kill a weakened and defenceless child. Goblins can be very decent folk, as we've seen many times, but this one, sorry. But that really is something unforgivable. Solomon's reaction here then, it goes without saying, ridiculously ungrateful. Let's follow up with what he says to us afterwards. What Sebastian did was inexcusable. You cannot possibly be about to defend him. Sebastian and I have encountered Ranrock's loyalists before. That goblin would have killed Anne. This family does not resort to using dark magic even against our enemies. What Sebastian did cannot be undone. That you are defending Sebastian's behavior at all tells me everything I need to know. You are as guilty as he is. Look, how much of a zealot can you be? It's one thing to have values, okay? That's respectable. But Solomon's unwavering stance of total negativity towards everything Sebastian does, the fact that he saved Anne's life and all Solomon can fixate on is the fact that he did so with Imperio. So what? This bit genuinely makes me angry. A, a simple thank you, however we need to teach you some alternatives to Unforgivables, which would also have worked in that situation, would have been a much more appropriate and constructive response to give Sebastian. It leads me to wonder, in fact, whether Solomon would have preferred it if Anne had just died there and then. After all, he sees her as a walking corpse pretty much already, and no doubt the goblin would have ended her misery pretty quickly. Overall, it appears as though Solomon would rather watch his family die than permit them from casting some dark spells. A total hypocritical standpoint to take, as we'll soon come to in just a moment, but first. The Shadow of the Mind Quest doesn't include a huge amount of character development on top of what we've already explored, but we do get some further insight at the end of how deep cut Sebastian's hatred of goblins really is, this being the only real instance where he displays hostility towards us when we declare that we're working with Lodgok. It's the only moment of genuine confrontation between the two of us, though not long after he does call and apologise and we're friends again, because, you know, he's a decent kid and not a totally closed-minded greybeard with eternally unfaltering opinions. It further informs though just why at the time he felt fully justified to slit that goblin's throat in the previous quest. In the Shadow of Hope may seem like a throwaway encounter before the climactic events of the next big quest, but the information here actually holds a crucial detail to the entire case. It involves Solomon's status as an ex-Aura, and well, let me just play it for you. Do you think your uncle would tell anyone at the Ministry about all of this if he found out? If he found out. I doubt he'd go to the Ministry. He didn't part ways with them well from what I understand. He won't say, but I believe his strong aversion to dark magic has something to do with his time there. Anne thinks he once decided to fight fire with fire, so to speak, and resorted to using an unforgivable curse and fight against dark wizards. At least that's what she thought she heard. When he realized what his job had led him to become, 
He left rather abruptly. So, I'm not sure he'd go to the Ministry to report on his own family using dark magic now. Okay, so we have to take this with a grain of salt, since it's all constructed on ifs and maybes, but if this is true, then Solomon is a total hypocrite who used dark magic in his final days as an aura. Clearly, it shook him so hard that he went completely the other way afterwards. It's the classic case, of course, of the strictest parents being those with a misspent youth. They know firsthand the consequences of particular wrongdoings, and that's what makes them so fearful of their offspring following in their footsteps. Solomon Sallow has let his own fear of dark dark magic hold back those around him. Look, when you outright forbid someone from doing something, particularly a kid, it's always going to go one of two ways. They'll either get scared and avoid forbidden things like the plague, or, often if they're more clever and curious, they'll just practice said thing in secret, and as a result, much more dangerously. It's why kids with strict parents are more likely to overdose on alcohol or other substances, because their total inexperience coupled with the hard desire to rebel is so much more dangerous than parents who respect but educate their children in grown-up choices. Imagine for a moment if Solomon had been supportive throughout all of this. He'd have been a nigh-on unrecognisable persona, yes, but consider he was someone Sebastian could confide in. They could study the secrets of the relic together, maybe even keeping it from Anne at first in case it didn't work, not getting her hopes up for no reason, as per Solomon's wishes. The two might have actually got somewhere. Sebastian wouldn't have become so unhinged had his uncle struck the right balance of nurturing but also tempering his growth. Professor Garlic would compare it to two plants. A, one that's carefully trellised and pruned for the best yield, as opposed to B, one left to run wild and destroy everything around it. Sebastian, in his current state then, is a fast-growing, strong plant left to develop with zero guidance. Incredibly destructive in the wrong environments without appropriate care. But accusing him of wrongdoing for pursuing what he fully believes to be right, it's kind of like accusing an ivy plant of wrongdoing for killing its host tree. It's not an act of evil per se, it's just doing its best with the lot that it's given. Ladies and gentlemen, we now come to the culmination. The moments you've been waiting for. The acts which we could verbalise as unforgivable, but only in the sense that an unforgivable curse is used. Beginning the In the Shadow of the Relic quest, we learn that Sebastian has started summoning in Ferry down in the crypt. Taking that curious but unguided student metaphor again, it's clear that Sebastian is starting to become reckless with the dark magic that he's learning. With nobody to guide or advise him, it's like he's found an old box of fireworks and is letting each off one by one, having merely read the vague and heavily outdated instructions on the back. He's still just a curious, unsupervised boy, but it's starting to become clear that if left unchecked, people will start to get hurt. So, we fight our way through the crypt against the Inferi which Sebastian has failed to control, and finally confronts him with some harsh truths, to which it seems like he's about to listen and maybe acknowledge his overhastiness, but then. the two of you done? Solomon enters the room, and just as was foreshadowed earlier by the Shrivel Fig, destroys yet another thing with the potential power to save Anne. The relic. For a split second, as the Inferi aggro, it seems he might be second-guessing his rashness. Do we detect a flicker of fear? Well, too late for that. Sebastian admittedly strikes first with a basic cast, but after this, it's Solomon, who squares up for a full-on fight, before attacking us. Fine, that's a Levioso, could be much more lethal, but it would have left us helplessly hovering to be mauled by Inferi. He then continues assaulting us, despite the fact that his nephew is defending against more Inferi and could be killed. Sebastian then points out that Solomon should protect us, and Solomon assures us that he is, whilst at the same time glaciusing me to again be helplessly hit by an Inferius. He insists it's us who's making him do this, but he is literally draining our health down to death levels. We will die if we don't fight back here. We literally ask him multiple times to stop when starting to get the upper hand, to which he is astounded that we would even suggest he could be in the wrong. He's so morally freaking sure of himself still, whilst also attacking two teenagers at the same time. He then attempts bloody fiend fire on us, which, whilst not an unforgivable, is arguably worse than a Varda Kedavra. We would die in this bout of flame, clearly, only in this instance it would also be utterly agonising. He uses this multiple times when in the lower third of his health bar. But then, when finally drained of health, we enter a cutscene. This is where Sebastian's use of the killing curse is framed as murder from a certain perspective. Solomon doesn't attack in this scene, he merely defends himself, weakened, and tries to reason with Sebastian, to which the 
to reply is a big green bolt of death. After everything then, from Solomon's constant quelling of Sebastian's ideas right up to him downright attempting to murder the only friend who's actually supported Sebastian the whole way, Sebastian resorts to the final thing he can think of, the nuclear option. In a moment fueled with pent-up frustration, rage, and possibly a bit of protective instinct, after all, most of the spells he taught us previously were to defend ourselves, Sebastian raises his wand in the air and yells two unforgivable words. I won't let her suffer. Now, if you've seen my forerunner to this video, exploring the aftermath of this, you already know the details as to what happens next. So I'll be very, very brief this time. Anne obviously appears moments later and Apolso Sebastian into the wall, apparates away with Solomon and buries her uncle alone just here outside the Sala residence. I know I said there wasn't a grave in the last video, sorry, I'm blind, it's right there. Bernard Undier, if spoken to afterwards, tells us that Solomon tragically died in his sleep, and through that lie, Sebastian can potentially walk free, depending on our choice. Now, I'm not saying that you definitively shouldn't turn Sebastian in here. I know people roleplay all sorts of different characters, everything from benevolent Hufflepuffs to malevolent Slytherins who might just want Sebastian off the table for their own convenience. After all, who's to say he won't clutter up our time more soon trying to harness our ancient magic to cure Anne? Also, there's the whole thing with Unforgivables which is drawn to our attention multiple times, that you really have to mean and want to cast them. Your intention has to be clear. You have to mean it. Sebastian could not have killed his uncle without at least some full intention to do so. But, I mean, Snape did kill Dumbledore, despite probably not fully wanting to, so that could potentially muddy the waters around this rule a little bit. But I think we've established here already that Solomon was enough of a blight on Sebastian's life, and an obstacle to Anne's salvation, which is Sebastian's super objective, that Sebastian had enough legitimately pressing reasons to take him off the table to mean the killing curse just enough. After all, it's never touched on exactly how much you need to mean it, and wanting to do something rash in a heightened moment is wholly different to fully premeditating something ages before carrying it out. Look, the choice is yours to turn him in after this or not, but morally, that's an evil and extremely hypocritical and cruel decision on our character's part. Hufflepuffs especially have seen what happens in Azkaban and what it does to people. This isn't a place for reform, it's a fate worse than death. Feeling betrayed and alone is what landed Sebastian in this mess in the first place. Azkaban would merely serve to complete a fantastic villain origin story, because the best villains are often the ones who walk the fine line between just that and a hero. And that's exactly what Sebastian has been to us from day one. Recognising our potential immediately, helping us to catch up with the other students in fifth year, teaching us spells to protect us from the alarming number of enemies around Hogwarts, he's clearly a remarkably capable wizard for his age, and the one thing, the one thing he's asking for in return is that we aid in his quest to find a way to cure his dying twin sister, whatever it takes. A small price to pay for salvation. Their parents are long dead, their guardian is too afraid of the shadow of his own past, their best friend would sooner lose one of them than risk losing both, and here's us, wielding a barely understood ability which may have the potential to put things right. We really are this kid and his sister's only remaining hope, especially with the relic having just been destroyed. So when Solomon tries to kill us too with multiple fiend fires, it could be argued that Sebastian of Vardicadavra him in our defence more so than anyone else's. Were that not the case even? it could still be argued that Sebastian acted to save another life. Ants, obviously. It was pointed out to me in the comments of my other Sebastian video that if you had the cure to a major illness, and somebody gave you the ultimatum to either kill them or destroy the cure, and inadvertently kill everyone it could have saved, it isn't exactly clear which choice is morally the best. Sure, one is first degree murder, but the other makes you complacent to potentially multiple other deaths of people who are arguably more innocent. It's a lose-lose situation, but ultimately it's a no-brainer for Sebastian to choose even a small hope at saving Anne's life over his walking, talking obstacle to progress of an uncle. Anne wasn't only the victim of Rookwood's curse, but also some major gaslighting. Solomon was an unyielding zealot who valued his beliefs more than love, while Sebastian and the player served as a mental and physical force of nature, respectively. From the moment we meet him as a Slytherin with his restricted section book, Sebastian has acted with one loving goal the entire time. He never wavered, and even after this,
Alice still hasn't given up. He was pushed to the brink and forced into a corner. A short while after the fact, he does regret the decision. Solomon was still his flesh and blood after all, despite being a morally hypocritical old fool. And if there's one dialogue option I would add to this game, it would be the ability for us to thank Sebastian for saving our life, from his uncle who tried multiple times to turn us to potash. Look, Sebastian may appear from the outset like a misfit, an emotionally manipulative, irresponsible young Slytherin who struck down his uncle with an unforgivable curse. But more than that, he's our boy. Brave like a Gryffindor, loyal as a Hufflepuff, and hella smart, more so than those square Ravenclaws. But above all, he's determined, like a Slytherin, channeling his ambition not towards some outdated ideal like blood status, as many fellow Slytherins would, but towards something that truly matters. Love and family. Ironic, I know, given the circumstances, and you may wish to tell me that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. But if that's the case, then is the road to heaven paved with utter complacency and sitting on the sidelines? Is it better to stand by and do nothing when there's even a slither, a slither in, of a chance to save her? Sebastian did only what he thought was right. He's a much more morally sound character than us, unless we play a particularly unadventurous playthrough, and ratting him out is not only hypocritical, but it's also downright ungrateful. Whatever comes next, we'll face it together. Sebastian will learn from this, but only if he doesn't spend the rest of his days in Dementor Paradise. But do you agree with me? Would you say Sebastian Sallow did absolutely nothing wrong? Or do you in fact hold some argument that he's pure evil? Whilst this video is fairly comprehensive on the matter, I made it with the intention to start a further discussion on this topic overall. So please, head down below and comment your take on this. After all, it's one of the most morally grey, layered, and brilliant storylines that I think there are in the entire Wizarding World franchise. And there's literally limitless takes and perspectives to be had here. So go on, critique mine, add yours to the pile, or just critique other people's, and let's explore this further. Again, massive shout out to my Patreon supporters who make longer videos like this especially possible for me to do. To anyone else interested, you can donate from as little as a pound a month to get your name in each video like these awesome people, early access to content, and more features like voting and discord ranks in the future. Anyway, thanks for making it to the end, hopefully you found this deep dive interesting to watch or listen to. I'm Sam Brown, and I'll see you soon in another video.